Yeah, so I'm talking about that box um, and what's in it. Um, I'm Lara and I coded this with um, a chap called Dave Webb. Uh, it's, it's not part of my general work, it was something we sort of did outside of work. Um, but as a brief introduction, I'm an archaeologist, I've worked in commercial archaeology uh, and interpretation in non-archaeological <coughs> museums um, for most of my much of my working life as an archaeologist. You know, you always have other jobs in between. Um, and I'm currently working on an England-wide community archaeology project, um, recording coastal archaeology with uh, volunteers. Um, so, um, so most, a lot of non-archaeologists or people interested in archaeology have never been able to do it before. So that's kind of really to say that I'm not an artist, but I'm very interested in the way that you can communicate archaeology to people who maybe don't have a huge amount of archaeological experience or no archaeological experience, and often no archaeological interest either. Um, and Dave Webb, who did the sound, he's not an archaeologist either, he works in waste, but he's uh, been working with found sound for about 20 years, recording, making music, or making um, sound pieces. Um, so this piece grew out of Map Orkney Month, which in turn was part of Public Archaeology 2015, which was a year-long project and blog um, <coughs> led by archaeologists and non-archaeologists, um, which was solely about the creation of, um, of archaeology for public engagement, with the actual doing of the archaeology as the product. There was no sort of uh, idea of doing anything beyond actually just doing the archaeology. Um, and as part of that Map Orkney Month, which this piece was part of, um, was a, a project developed by Dan Lee of the project Archaeologists in Residence and the University of Highlands and Islands, where um, it was a creative mapping project where um, he asked people just to map their environment on Orkney for a day in a, absolutely any way they liked. So he set up the project, but then it was completely bottom up. However, people wanted to interpret what he'd asked them to do, that was what they could do. Uh, his, his idea was it was breaking down, um, mapping is often an exercise of power. Um, and his idea was to break down the sort of the power network of mapping and uh, to break down the borders between fact and fiction, objectivity and subjectivity. Um, and, uh, and also, although you know, people, obviously Orkney has, is incredibly rich in archaeology, so people were visiting archaeological sites, part of the idea of getting people to map was that through mapping, places would become archaeological. Um, they would become part of the archaeological record. So, um, and also, yeah, just to note, the more nerdy, map nerdy amongst you, because I'm sure there might be some here, might notice that this, um, I took the colours and the inspiration from uh, Ordnance Survey Explorer maps. I hope some people notice that. So, onwards. Um, so, not wishing to be left out, uh, James Dixon, who was one of the originators um, of uh, the Public Archaeology 2015, um, instigated a dispersed investigation of Orkney. Um, so, uh, gathering together a group of people who would map Orkney in London, <coughs> um, we were given a basic itinerary to follow. This is our basic itinerary. Um, and then, uh, again, we were like, given the freedom to explore it in any way, any way we desired for just one day. So, uh, never having visited Orkney, Dave and I were really excited to begin to explore Orkney, um, explore its sights and sounds. And, um, and in 2016, we went to chat, and that's actually when it became complete, because then we were actually able to explore Orkney, which was really exciting, having already explored it before. So, um, for the original tour, we, um, we needed some way of... I mean, obviously, Orkney is sort of... You know, it's a big area, it's large and small, and we only had a day, so we needed some way to contain Orkney within, within London. And we decided that we would... Um, well, the population of Orkney is 21,000. So we decided we would um, take the area of London, on average, um, contain 21,000 people. And in London, that's an area, let's say on average, roughly a mile by a mile and a half. It's not very big at all. So that was, um, so within the orange border, that's how, <coughs> that's how we contained Orkney in London. Then we hand plotted the, the spots on the map across, and there you can, it's sort of fade, but a bit the blue spots going across are roughly where we were going to be visiting our sites. And some of the red, the red letters and numbers, that was actually where we ended up um, going. 
and setting off exploring because we thought at first we would stick exactly to the spot and record exactly what was on the spot. But then thinking about all mapping, even if it's pretending not to be, is an imaginative exercise. And um, the gentle author, who I don't know if many of you know, um, he, uh, he's an author who works a lot in East London, says that the urge to wander should never be resisted. And we thought we'd go with that. So um, I'm just showing this quickly because this was a major influence on our work. If you haven't read it, it's an absolutely brilliant book. Um, it's about a reimagining of the Auto Route de Soleil from between Paris and Marseille. Um, and it's a, it's a beautiful exercise in forgetting everything you know about or think you know about a place and then rediscovering that place. And that's what we, what we wanted to do with the mapping because we live in East London, so we thought we knew it, but we had to forget it to find Orkney in it. So I'm going to present some images from the installation, but first I'm going to talk about why we decided to present it as we did. And it's a bit of a fuzzy slide, but it's a stereoscopic picture of a lady looking at a stereoscope. And I quite like the idea of a stereoscope because that was the way that people used to visit sites that they couldn't go to otherwise and used to experience sites in this kind of three-dimensional manner. Um, and I love stereoscopes. But um, apart from that, then we thought we'd enclose it in a box as well because dioramas also used to be another way to visit, visit places and spaces that you couldn't actually go to. Um, and we also wanted to include sound, because I think sound is... It was really interesting listening to the cave, uh, that one. I'm definitely going to that site afterwards. Because I think sound is often missing from archaeological interpretation, but it's such a fundamental part of the way that we experience existence. So, um, so we have sound running in there as well, and that's uh, split left and right. So you have the sounds of London on one side, the sounds of Orkney on the other. And if you put the headphones on the wrong way around, you get a completely different experience. So you can try that. So uh, this was one of the stops on our site. Um, this is the Ring of Brogga um, and uh, Bethnal Green gas holders. Um, we'd never actually, I'd never actually seen a picture of the Ring of Brogga, which is rather embarrassing to admit as an archaeologist. But we decided that before we visited Orkney in London, we wouldn't look at any pictures of Orkney. So we wouldn't be influenced in any way by what we knew, what we thought we should find, unless we already knew. So, um, in that way, it's quite interesting. We found lots of rings. We found roundabouts. We found uh, formal gardens. We found fountains. But it wasn't until we came to Bethnal Green uh, gas holders that we really thought that we had found the Ring of Brogga. And I think it was something in the monumentality of the place, but also in the sense of, of purpose of building, um, sort of building something that was completely fit for the purpose, even though you might know what that purpose is. Um, then um, we sort of also discovered uh, similarities of form, but only after the event. So uh, rather like this slide on a mound when we were walking around London. But it wasn't until we visited Orkney and we went to May Tower that we realised the significance of the site that we visited before. So I quite like the way that things become significant in retrospect. There's also obviously graf graffiti at both sites, which is brilliant, but you can't see that in these. But that's a whole other thing to explore. Then um, at the easternmost part of our journey, we searched for Scarra Bray. Um, and we did find it in almost exactly the right spot, which was, we were joyous at the synchronicity of finding um, a block of flats where we'd expected to find a, um, a site of habitation. And, and at that time then, and especially when we went, we visited Orkney, our thoughts were sort of wandering around what makes a place a place, the ideas of communality and interconnectedness. And actually when we visited Scarra Bray, I think interestingly, what we were most animated about talking about was actually the connections between the houses and the, and the walkways and the covered walkways as opposed to the more obvious things that people discuss about Scarborough when they go there. We were sort of thinking about yeah, routes to and from places, the idea of walkways in the sky which was you know, a big thing about building, building flats. Um, so I think it, it, it did allow us to think differently about places that we visited. Um, and then uh, yeah, this is the final slide I wanted to show. Um, because there were obviously lots of differences and a few similarities, but the one huge sort of similarity between both places was, um, was pubs. Pubs don't change over, over distance and time, it seems. Um, and, we, you know, thinking about those as places for gathering and exchange, they were both family gatherings. The people in the left were talking about living in the east end of London during the war, during the Blitz, and the people on the right were catching up. Sounds awful, I was completely eavesdropping, actually. People on the right were talking about things they'd just been doing um, as well. Um, otherwise, I think 
much of Orkney in London reverberated to the sound of traffic and footfall, and that's something you can never get away from in London. But it's interesting that even in Orkney, in urban Kirkwall, the overriding sound was birds, and you just couldn't get away from them. It was actually quite, they've made quite an incredible recording of sparrows in some ivy, which you can hear if you listen to it. Um, and it gave us, it also sort of allowed some disassociation in a way, because at the Ring of Brodger, there's just been some new excavations. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> and um, they found that there was a big settlement site to the Ring of Brogba. So, in a way, listening to different sounds when you're looking at a familiar picture maybe allows you to disassociate really what you're thinking. Because we visit the Ring of Brogba and we think that this is still quite a landscape, but it, it wasn't. And I think pairing pictures helps you, helps you think about that. So, I was just trying, finishing to say that I'm um, not sure where, exactly where we're going with this. Probably not going to do any more in Orkney because it feels like it was a whole circle thing. But now I'm having talked to Corrie, I'm quite interested in tourism and tourist maps. And this is my visit to Helsinki last week, where I visited top ten tourist destination, top seven. This is Southampton, which Corrie pointed out is actually very similar in shape to Helsinki. This is yet unexplored, but I hope to do it before the weekend. It's not a weekend, before the days are up. And that was me. Oh no, that's just thanks. Sorry, big thanks to these people. Sorry, it was a bit long.